Good evening, people. This is Sean with Strangeland Oddities, and we are doing a interview here right now with internationally icon, horror icon, Sid Haig, who is best known as Captain Spaulding for Rob Zombie's movies like Devil's Rejects and House of a Thousand Corpses. How are you doing today, Sid? I'm doing great. Good day. The, the fires are dying down, and uh, everything's cool. Excellent. Now we're doing this interview for Days of the Dead Atlanta, uh, which is February 2nd through the 4th. Now the reason we're doing the interview now is because the convention is going to be hectic. We may not be able to get the interview in at that, at that point. But as I promised to everybody and the fans, I got your questions. And I'm going to ask Sid all your questions. And hopefully he has the answers that you guys are looking for. Now, Sid, this is going back just a little bit. Uh, looks like your fans do some research on you. This is going back to when you were in the Batman series and you were, got to blow white powder in Batman and Robin's face. Now, can you bring us back there and tell us what was going through your mind being that this was taking place in the, in the 60s? Um, well, uh, that, that was pretty early on in my career, and uh, I was just trying to get through, you know, without screwing things up and uh, blowing powder in people's faces. It's, it's kind of iffy, you know. I, I was nervous about maybe getting stuff in their eyes, and, you know, things going bad, but uh, that was my job, and I did it. <laughs> and nobody got hurt. No eyes were harmed during the blowing of that scene. All right, so no horror back at that time. All right, now we got another question here. Uh, this is from a James Iso from when you were in James Bond, Diamonds Are Forever, when you threw Lana Wood from a Vegas high-rise window who also happened to be nude. How did that feel? I know the answer that I would say, but I'd like to hear your words. Probably be the same as yours. Uh, and, you know, uh, it doesn't get any better than that. I mean, she was so cool. She was cool about it. She didn't make a big fuss or anything. And uh, we tried to do it as uh, as discreetly as we could. Uh, and uh, you know, it, uh, it was a little highlight in the film. I mean, then you get to you know see a beautiful woman think of being thrown out a window. Well, hey. That's a highlight right there. <laughs> oh, definitely could not have said that any better. Now, this one is coming from a Sherry Bravo. She says, like many actors start off as musicians, do or did you get to jam with any that you are a fan of? And if not, who would you love to get on stage with? When I uh, had my band together in uh, 1958, uh, rock and roll was like only four years old, okay? So it was young, it was exciting, it was uh, just amazing to be with all those people. And Dick Clark at one point um, had a road show uh, with amazing stars. Domino and Nellie Brothers and uh, Paul Anka when he was a little kid and all of that business. And uh, through the tour, he would pick up a band, a local band, that had some recognition. And at that point, uh, we did a song called Full House. Uh, and in a lot of major uh, areas, it got as high as number four. So we got capped to be, to just do that song on his road show. And that was the most amazing thing in the world, to be hanging out backstage with all these uh, horror, I mean, these, these uh, rock, rock star, uh, stars. It's just, it was awe-inspiring, okay? And just kind of drove us to be a little better than we actually were. Nice. So what made the transformation of going from a musician to an actor? 
process you're looking up a little bit. The transition, uh, what made you decide to put music on hold and start doing acting? Yeah. When you started doing the music, um, what made you s decide to say, hey, I'm going to put music on hold and I'm going to start doing acting? Ah, okay. All right, yeah. At 19, I was pretty smart. Probably smarter than I am now. Uh, we were doing all these shows and uh, we were doing all these shows and we would tour every weekend we would do like four shows in a, in a weekend in different parts of the uh, state we were up and down California and uh, crowded arenas and a um, whole bottle of wax everything was you know uh, just coming up rosy except for the fact that we weren't making any money because we were at the height of payola uh, and that those payoffs to disc jockeys to play your songs are part of production and you didn't make any money until production costs were met well those production costs never were met so we, we weren't making any money i mean we'd make money doing you know live performance but in terms of selling records and and, and jukebox plays and uh, uh radio plays and things like that we weren't making a dime I said, well, you know what? This is not for me. I'm out of here. And, and that was that. I still had fun. We would get together and jam and have a good time and, uh, and still do from time to time, you know? Uh, but uh, no, that, that, that business of, uh, uh, you know, just working your butt off and not getting paid for it is uh, why I wasn't buying that at all. Yeah, I we we do a, a lot of work with a lot of musicians who've been around for 20 years, etc. They still don't make money, but the reason that they do it is for the fans, which you got to give them a lot of credit for cuz you know, if if you're going out and you're doing what you love and you're not making the money and you got a family to support, it's kind of hard. So, but yeah. yeah. All right, now we have another question. It says, Dear Sid, you've appeared on so many iconic TV shows like Batman, Star Trek, Dukes of Hazard, A-Team, etc., and films like James Bond, Coffee, Foxy Brown, with my favorite filmmaker, Quentin Tarantino, and of course, Rob Zombie. What is the biggest difference from doing telly versus movies and the biggest difference in TV and movie cast members? Well, the thing with TV is that you just got to crank it out every day. And uh, there's not a lot of time spent in character development or, or anything like that. It's just say the words and let's get on with it, okay? And there are some studios that you had to be word for word, you know, and they would stop you. And, and say, no, that's not supposed to be and such and such. It's supposed to be but so and so. And, oh, geez, okay, yeah, fine. So, you know, it was just a a, uh, uh, a drag race to try to, you know, get all the work done. <laughs> However, in doing big films, um, you had that time to to develop characters and 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 the relationships between different characters and explore that whole thing. I mean, I did a film called The Swashbuckler with uh, uh, Robert Shaw and James Earl Jones, and it took nineteen weeks. Okay, oh wow, that's like doing that's like doing a whole TV series just just <laughs> time wise. Okay, just to do this one film. I mean, we were two weeks at the studio, two weeks in Corner Rocket where the real wealthy Mexican families go to vacation, and then nine weeks in Puerto Vallarta, and then six weeks more back at the studio. So they took the time to make the thing right. And, uh, and that's the thing that I really appreciate about doing film as opposed to television. 
And I mean, I did. There was there was a point in time when they would just recycle scripts. Within a period of like three weeks, I, I did this role, and then like three weeks later, I did the exact same role, only it was a western. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> you know, there was just no creativity. You just had to crank stuff out. So, yeah, that that definitely would would definitely become uh, kind of boring to do the same thing and do it as a western, where with movies they give you the more creativity to do what you want to do. Yeah, yeah. And being part of that question, um, she did mention something about Quentin Tarantino. Now, you were offered a role in his second film, Pulp Fiction. Um, and you ended up turning it down, but later down the road, you took the role in Jackie Brown. Why did you turn down Pulp Fiction? Okay, because of the conversation that we just had before, uh, I had this long conversation with my agency, and I don't want to do any more television right now. It's crazy. You just have to crank it out and crank it out and just spit out the words and, and let's get on with it. Uh, and I want to be able to take the time to develop something, okay? And I went on an interview for Pulp Fiction. Uh, Quentin wanted me to do the role. I wanted to do the role. I mean, he started off the interview by saying, I've always admired your work. And I said, well, it's, it's good to know that, you know, people um, are paying attention and, and, you know, like what you do. And he said, no, look around. And it was in his office, and I looked around, and there were one sheets on all, all the walls, and I was in every one of those films. He made me sign one of them before I left, okay? Oh, nice. That's how much we both, that's how much we both wanted me to do that role. And then the deal came down, and it was for one day. And I said, excuse me, didn't we have this conversation? There are four locations involved. How the hell are we going to do this in one day if it's not just cranking it out? And I and I said, no, nobody bothered to tell me that Quentin doesn't work that way. If the contract says one day, that doesn't mean anything. If it took two weeks to do a one day uh, contractual agreement, well, then it took two weeks. Uh, nobody bothered to explain any of that to me, so that's how I lost the role. Mm. Well, at least you got to make it up and do Jackie Brown and work with Quentin. Uh, he's an amazing person. Yeah. All right. Um, now let's get back to.